Welcome to the Hardware Asylum Podcast Extras. In this episode, it's about radiator envy. And does size matter? I'm your host, Dennis Garcia. With me today, I have Darren McGee. Dennis, this week I was thinking about maybe doing some upgrades to my PC. I figure it's getting a little long in the tooth in a couple of different places, uh-huh. and it might be time to do some performance upgrades. What kind of performance upgrades were you thinking? Well, I was kind of looking at the weak spots, and as an example, I've got a uh, a Samsung M.2 drive in there, but it's a generation or two old now. It's the, it's the first generation, right, at 256 megs. That's right. So gigs. it's a little small, maybe a little slow by today's standards. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the video cards are, I think, the obvious target. As you know, and listeners probably recall, I've got a 1070 in it that I adore in MSI Gaming. Mm-hmm. And not too long ago, we put in a second, a Seahawk, actually. Yeah, so they're both water-cooled. You had one video card that was water-cooled for the longest time, and then we yes. just added the second one as an SLI. Yeah, and that was a lot of fun, but it did take us away from doing the vertical video card, which I really liked, especially mm-hmm. with the water cooling. And we had to remove your sound card. Yeah, which I kind of missed too, but you know, now I'm on an external card. But anyway, mm-hmm. that's beside the point, Dennis, because I started looking out there and figured maybe it's time to jump to a, uh, I don't know, maybe a 2070 Super, for example. We've got a little bit of adventures there that maybe we'll talk about in a minute, but long story short is I uh, I ordered a new video card. Probably by the time we get to our next podcast, we'll uh, we'll actually be uh, getting serious about this build, but it got me thinking about the way that we're doing cooling. Okay. So I got a faster card, mm-hmm. a couple of generations newer, I guess, if you count the ties in the regular 2070s. Yeah, there's a couple of jumps there, I think. So I'm due, right, as a general rule here at... at the hardware asylum, we like to say that if you're two generations behind, you're probably due for a jump in the video card arena or CPU arena, unless you're running AMD and then it's probably like six or seven jumps. Well, yeah, unless you're in a thread ripper and then you've already made a mistake. <laughs> oh yeah. That is true. Wait, no, did I say that? You um, said that a lot. Of yes. course it depends on, on, on what you're doing. I'm just going to backpedal a little bit, but anyway, um, <laughs> as luck would have it, Dennis, I started thinking, well, if I'm going to do, new cooling, we should do more cooling. Since we do uh, the hard bends and the fancy cooling, why not go all out and do an extreme build? I mean, even more extreme than we're doing now, maybe two loops. And so um, I was thinking about this when along through my Facebook feed, which is where all good ideas come from, right? Always. Uh, (laughs) I saw this really incredible cool Lance radiator, and I had never seen one before. And in the hardware arena for me, that's pretty rare. Okay. So describe this cool Lance radiator that you saw. So cool Lance, of course, is a company that's been around for a while. So we're not talking about some weird, crazy Korean brand or something, but this is a radiator that is three fans across by three fans long, like a Tic Tac board. In fact, it would be really cool to do a colored build of Tic Tac on it, maybe. And I thought, oh, yeah, we could get some RGB fans and actually play Tic Tac. How cool is that, right? That'd be so, awesome. So anyway, uh, a lot of our listeners know that uh, my case in particular is is designed to be a, a showcase for some of the fun stuff that we do, and it isn't particularly practical. So this cool Lance radiator, I thought we could maybe find a way to replace one entire side of the case. Now, I'm not talking about those silly all-fan cases here. I'm talking about a serious build. Oh. Well, I mean, as serious as you can be. As serious as you can be is with an external with radiator. A giant radiator, but it got me thinking. I mean, how much radiator is enough? And, and I know we've talked about CPU coolers and even GPU coolers before, mm-hmm. but have we really ever talked about extreme radiators? Well, we did do an extreme water cooling project not too long ago where we put vodka in a water loop. Well, I think that's a little different, although you could put more vodka in this radiator. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you could. So the we did tackle, or I should say I tackled the water cooling, I don't know, the baseline, if you will. So what do you need to build a water cooling loop? And how should you judge what to buy? So if we're looking at doing a upgrade on... Uh, my build, for example, I mean, the obvious first step would be to do those components that are the slow pieces Mm -hmm. and then maybe follow it up with, I don't know, a new motherboard and processor, some fancy new RAM. Maybe we could water cool the RAM. I don't know. But um, I don't really know how to choose a radiator. I mean, the traditional sense 
is, okay, what kind of radiator fits in my case? I will go with that. Well, that is, that's a good way to look at it. And a lot of people on Reddit probably do the exact same thing. It's well, like, yeah. Pick I, a brand you trust and, and you're good, right? Yeah, just we have a spot, uh, this case supports three radiators. So we're going to install three radiators. Nice. You don't need three radiators. Mm -hmm. For the general rule of thumb that I put in this article that I'll link down in the show notes, how to build a water cooling loop. What is needed? Water. Water. <laughs> there is a section in here about radiators, and it talks about the thickness of the radiator, the fin density. The idea is that the more liquid you have in the radiator, the higher the fin density, the more heat can be removed from the water. But to do that, you have to have more fan pressure to be able to push it through. It it's all runs in scale. But the general rule of thumb that I put in here was that a single 120 millimeter radiator okay can dissipate about 250 watts of heat okay and that is not really taken into consideration things like fan noise because obviously to dissipate 250 watts you need to have a pretty powerful fan so there's another argument for my monster right mm -hmm. maybe i don't need any fans i can go back to the zalman route right you could if you have a big enough radiator and a bit of airflow, okay, you got to have, you know, because you got to have a, a convection current of some sort. So, if you can get air running through there, you don't necessarily have to have the fan because the reason for the fan is to actually just move the air. So You're making a, a heat transfer between air and water. So maybe we go a different route. So we got 120 times three. That's right. 360 right carry mm -hmm. the carry the fan yeah. and then you go 360 by 360 there's got to be a you know a, a really big 360 millimeter fan out there with some nice leds on it uh, it sounds super I not possible all of a sudden. i don't know if it has any leds but there's these uh these things called box fans that you can get from walmart for like 10 bucks uh, i feel like that is not the solution i'm looking for <laughs> um it's a little bit larger but um all these right are definitely um Definitely larger, that's for sure. So before we go too much further, I think we should step back a little bit and talk about well, how much heat does your machine produce? How do, you, how do you figure that out? When I'm testing coolers on Hardware Asylum, I'm looking at the thermal design power of the CPU, the TDP. That would be the heat that's generated by the CPU under full load. Okay. The load changes based off of what sort of calculations are going through the CPU, because you can have like Prime 95, for instance, in one loop, it might dissipate 100 watts of heat. And then the second loop, it might dissipate 250 watts of heat. So you have to know which load you're using to be able to accurately get that. So adding a video card is addition? Is it a multiplier? It's an addition. It's not necessarily multiplying the heat load, although some people that know a little bit more about thermal dynamics will say, yes, it is a logarithmic scale and blah, 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 blah. But for our purposes, it's basically addition. So if we have a 200 watt CPU okay, and we have a 300 watt GPU, right, the total loop temperature would be around 500 watts. Now, we also need to add things like the pump heat because the pump's going to actually generate heat. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then of course, fluid dynamics, there's going to be heat generated by just moving the fluid through the loop. Sure. But all of that is pretty minimal on top of what our major primary heat sources are. So 500 coming, watts. 500 watts. So we're coming back to radiators, but radiators are thinner and thicker and denser and not denser. So mm -hmm. what is the optimal configuration? This is my rule of thumb, obviously. The 120 millimeter single fan radiator will dissipate 250 watts. So for our 500 watt loop, we should have at least a 240 millimeter radiator. That's assuming that we have pretty powerful fans, maybe a clamshell sort of thing. Now, if we want to keep the system quiet, we use a larger radiator. Larger, like more fans, like, thicker? Like a 360, for instance. Ah, okay. That way we can run a thin radiator, three fans on there, just run those three fans, and that would dissipate all the heat and not generate as much noise. By adding a thicker radiator, for instance, we can run a slightly more powerful fan. It will dissipate a little bit more heat, but it's going to be like maybe an extra 20 watts, if that. Okay. So the idea is that with the thicker radiator, we can have a little bit more heat capacity, get the temperature a little bit lower, at the expense of having a more powerful fan, we've got to have a high pressure fan to be able to push through those fins and still be as efficient. That's kind of the theory behind it, where we have a larger radiator, 
More heat dissipating capacity. Wow, that was a tongue twister. More. More. So much more. <laughs> so much more. So the idea is that the thicker radiator just gives you a slight edge. So if you're on that cusp where you have 500 watts and you need to dissipate a slightly more than 500, you can run a thicker radiator or just add another fan if your case supports it. In our builds, we're running 280s, which is the dual 140s. That is, you know, it's going to dissipate close to 300 watts per fan. Now that's pretty impressive. So there's another piece to the puzzle too, though. Where do you put the radiator and what difference does it make? I've seen cases that have it in the front, which ironically my current build does. Yeah. But most frequently I see it at the top, which to me makes a little more sense, right? Because heat rises. Yeah. And I've also seen radiators, like you mentioned before, two radiators or three radiators. And, and you know, does it matter? Uh, a lot of people will say it doesn't matter. A lot of the YouTube guys will say, no, it doesn't matter. The way I look at it, a radiator is just basically a heat vehicle. We're transferring the heat from the liquid into the air. So if we have a radiator on our intake into our case where we're blowing air through the radiator, we're dumping all the heat that's dissipating into the air into our case that now has to be vented out of the case. So a lot of times when you see the radiator at the top of the case, that's because it's exhausting out. So now we have cool air in our case and we're exhausting all the heat out the top. Instead of actually pulling cool air in, heating it up in the radiator and then dissipating it. So I know there's a positive negative aspect, right? Cause mm -hmm. you can create positive airflow or negative airflow or air pressure. It's using pressure, it. something yep. like that. Right. Yep. So as my case, for example, has two fans pushing air in the front through the radiator and three fans pushing it out. Yeah. You have three exhausts and two intake, I believe. Okay. So that's a negative pressure. Yeah. And the positive and negative air pressure is primarily for air cooled cases. And the idea behind that is that, it doesn't collect as much dust because we're actually um, pressurizing the dust so it doesn't have a chance to settle. Well, I like that, but that also affects cooling, right? It does. Um, for water cooling, the air flow is not the same as if you just have regular fans, case fans in your case because of the, um, <laughs> the pressure going through the radiator. It tends to slow down the velocity, so it, it changes things slightly. So I think if I'm understanding correctly, you always want more radiator than the heat that you need to dissipate. Yep. Just so, like in a power supply, you want a little slightly more power so that it's more efficient. So now the three times three is starting to sound like a good idea again. Oh yeah. Well, so we got nine fans, maybe 18, cause you could do the clamshell, right? The push pull mm -hmm. method. And assuming that we pick a good fan, maybe not the cool ants, but I mean, there got to be other people that make these bad boys, right? Uh, we could dissipate an amazing amount of cooling, right? Yeah, we could dissipate all sorts of heat. Now, the the radiator, the cool ants radiator you were looking at, mm -hmm. I went out to Mod My Mods. Okay. And they have a decent selection of radiators, including one from Watercool, which is a MORA3 360 Pro stainless steel. And I think the shell is stainless steel. Oh, yeah. That's definitely prettier than the Cool Ants one. The thing is, this radiator is designed for industrial use. It's an external heat exchanger. So this is the type of radiator you use for a, like a server farm. It's a little excessive for like a desktop PC, I think. Okay, but more is better, right? More is better. It's like the, uh, what is it, that adage, uh, speed is a matter of money. How fast <laughs> do you want to go? Right, I think I remember that movie. Or a, um, there's no replacement for displacement. Ah, yeah, that's the one. All right. Which so, is true. So now, we're displacing heat, though, so it sort of works. It sort of works. Okay. This particular radiator, assuming that we could get a convection current to go through it, we wouldn't necessarily need to have any fans. Or we could just have like three of them on there. The thing is, we have a whole lot of surface area that's kind of wasted. We have a whole lot of extra coolant that has to go through this thing. And for a normal desktop gaming build, I think it might be a little excessive. It's cool. It is cool. I would probably do this. It is a little expensive too. It is a little expensive. Now, maybe if NVIDIA still allowed us to run four-way SLI <laughs> and we could get a build of you know, four RTX 2080 ties together on a, um, what is it? A 10, 
8900X on a X299 dark Ooh. and overclock the whole thing. Maybe we might feel a little heat coming off this thing. <laughs> that bad. <laughs> so with that being said, maybe what we should do is go to the, the accepted experts on water cooling. Sure. EK has this custom cooling configurator where we can actually kind of dream build our PC and they can let us know what it is that we really need to have. Oh, that's a handy resource. Okay. So we go out here, we're going to click on some stuff, click here, and we want to have the overclocking performance. Yeah, yeah, bring it. And we just basically put our 10900X in there on our X299 Dark without mm -hmm. a video card. Oh, yeah, that's right. And it's claiming that our system is going to be generating about 250 watts of heat. I'm not sure where that number came from, but it sounds okay. Maybe they're including the pump. Okay. And it's saying that we're going to have expected liquid temperature of 28 degrees centigrade at around 34 dB. That all sounds good. Well, that's assuming that you're using their fans and, and equipment, right? Yep. We can consider that as a baseline. Now, the, the, the target temperature that they come up with is based off of running a 360 triple 120 millimeter radiator. Okay. And we had talked about that earlier. According to my estimation, that should dissipate about 750 watts of heat. But what they did is they overkilled the radiator to bring our expected noise level down. Oh, yeah. So they our... can run slower fans or something. Okay. Right. So in your particular build, you have a, a 280 radiator, two video cards, and a CPU. Right. And according to my estimation, that radiator is probably a little undersized for your particular loop. But right. it's worked pretty well. And I have been running 32, 35 degrees Celsius on the average. So it's a little warmer than what I would expect, I guess. Yeah, but it's still within range. But it's, it's not the 28C that they're talking about. No, it's not. And of course, they also qualify this as um, the room temperature is 22C because the room temperature is going to change things. No, that's a good point. As the heat rises, it's going to raise the liquid temperature, and that will actually raise your component temperature. And, of course, with blocks and stuff, there's a lot of factors involved with this. And this is where we can add some, uh, some extreme components, right? Okay, yeah. So, obviously, we can change the fans. We can put more powerful fans in there. Right now, we're running the, the Thermaltake Ring fans, which are a high-pressure fan. They are, and they're pretty. And I rewired those so that they spin up based off of the CPU temperature, not by the <laughs> the uh, controller temperature. It was really inaccurate. So. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we it a, is a you know an, an early system and, and not the most expensive. Nope. So what we did is we plugged it into the motherboard, so it reacts with cpu temperature and as the loop temperature rises it's going to raise the cpu temperature which totally makes sense yeah so that way the fans work harder it actually will start dissipating heat for your particular build if we went with a 360 rad you would already you would increase your cooling considerably just because we have more surface area now if we did two radiators like we have the 280 up front and say we do another 280 in the top right now we've effectively doubled the amount of cooling capacity that your loop has and also doubled the difficulty of getting it installed. Yeah, there is that. And the risk of it leaking and the cost of more fans. And so I guess it is kind of a, uh, a logarithmic increase or something like that. It's a bit of a difficulty level. Now you see some of these classic builds on, um, you know, on the line and whatnot where they have three radiators and it's like, well, how did you get three radiators to fit in there? Well, they do a little bit of modding and they do a creative way of looping water in, you know, instead of having it come in through the bottom, it might come in through the top through a 90 degree fitting that's hidden in the mod that they put in place. Right. So there are ways of making that work and making it look good, but it also increases the effort and the difficulty of it. Well, let's talk about it. if we just change the radiator. So we're talking increases that are, are pretty measurable. So mm -hmm. go from a 240 to a 360, for example. Well, if we use the EK measurements, our 360, the EK Coolstream PE 360 triple fan radiator. The recommended. It has a cooling power of 447 watts. So if we use their same measure for a 240, it's only 298 watts. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a pretty measurable increase there. Yeah. And it's a little bit more conservative than what I had estimated. But again, all these different factors play in. And 
being EK is a European company, they're going to favor silence over performance. Well, absolutely. Well, plus they want to make sure that they are more than covered in the margin there. So if I were looking for one today, I mean, obviously the EK is an example, but I know there are other coolers out there that you've mentioned. What, what kind of options do we have? I am a big fan and supporter of black ice radiators. I think you mentioned these guys earlier as one of the early PC radiators, right? Yeah, this is a company from Hardware Labs. The Black Ice is the name brand of the radiator. Ooh, I like it though, Black Ice. They've been around forever. And I have one of their new Nemesis radiators in my personal build. Right. And I have a couple of old school, just general Black Ice radiators in the lab that I use and some of them that I have not used, which is kind of strange. I think that's the one that we see in the background on many of these test pictures when you show the test bench, actually. Exactly. It looks very familiar. Yeah. Now, the one thing that I like about the black ice radiators is that they have two standard sizes. They have an extreme, which is slightly thicker, and then they have the standard 25 millimeter right. radiator. The fins themselves, they don't cheat themselves on where the fins are placed. We have a small gap from between the fan face and the radiator, and that is a, it acts as a plenum to help with cooling, but it's not extreme. Like some radiators, they have a really large gap and that somewhat infects cooling. More surface area, right? Mm -hmm. What about the cost? Is there, I mean, are you paying a significant amount more for a premium radiator as opposed to, you know, a standard one or a more common one like the thermal take that I'm running? Actually, the thermal take ones are more expensive than a lot of the black ice ones. Oh, interesting. And it's more or less um, the Hardware Labs black ice radiators are a standalone. They don't sell them in kits. Okay. Now, a lot of OEMs have picked up black ice radiators and included them. I think some of the first all-in-one coolers were using black ice radiators. That was one of their main suppliers was like, they built these radiators. They've gone to an all-in-one coolers from Asatec, for instance. I think they started building their own in-house, but this is where they started. That's one reason why you don't see these in a lot of builds because people buy kits. They buy an EK kit that comes with an EK radiator, which may or may not fit your particular build, depending on where the rivets are and stuff like that. But if you know what you're after and you're building your loop as a real DIY, this was the, my go-to. Well, and I'm assuming that they have fancy ones and lights and colors and all that kind of crazy stuff, right? Yeah, there's a few colored options where some of them are completely red, for instance, and some of them, the shell or the outer casing of it is a different color. But again, they normally come black. And yeah, well, if, if you're sure. building your loop as a DIY, you might as well just mask off the centerpiece and you know hit it with a spray can. No. You can change it to whatever color you want. And that doesn't affect the performance at all? No, because okay. you're just painting the outside. Oh, yeah, that makes sense, as long as you don't mess with the fins. Mm -hmm. Now, we've talked also a little bit in the past, and I just want to touch on it, the material that it's made out of, because we've made a lot of... A lot of I don't know, controversy maybe in, yeah, controversy. in the world of cooling over over whether the copper versus aluminum argument is valid. And maybe we don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but I feel like we should at least mention it. We have this thing called galvanic corrosion. And this is where we have mixed metals electrically conflicting, if you will. And we talked about this in a previous episode when we were bringing up the Thermal take water cooling kit that's actually in your build. Oh, yeah, and the different liquids. That's right. That's where it comes from. Yeah, so your radiator is made out of aluminum. That was the first TT Premium water cooling kits were using aluminum radiators. Okay. Every all-in-one cooler that you can buy on the market, any one of them, has an aluminum radiator. That doesn't make sense, though, because then they would all corrode, right? Right. But this is where the coolant that you use... And if it has a little bit of um, ethylene glycol mixed in it, it will prevent galvanic corrosion. Okay. This is why all-in-one coolers can run for years and years and years until the pump dies or the fan dies or you put a hole in the radiator. They'll run forever and not corrode, even though that the block, the cold plate inside the pump res is copper and the radiator is Aluminum. Well, that makes a ton of sense because they save as much money as possible in those all-in-ones. Yeah, that's very true. Now, in your particular loop, this is the TT Premium. We did that review three, almost four years ago. Right. That's when we put it together and it's been in two different loops. We've always used the Thermaltake C1000 Clear, which is 
well, not the clear, but we had the opaque before and now we have, we're running the clear. This is a coolant that has a lot of glycol in it and it's safe for mixed metals, like all sorts of mixed metal. You have nickel blocks, you have copper, you have aluminum. All of these things are basically, you put them in a, in a vat of just regular water, they're all going to corrode in some form or another. But your particular loop has been running four plus years, never a single problem. We haven't sprung a leak, we haven't actually uh, discolored anything, and it's all because of the coolant that we're using. Well, that's a definitely a, a positive aspect of the of thermal tank and, and a nice advantage of having a full kit together. Yeah, well, so, and on top of that, galvanic corrosion has been a thing forever, right? Right. Well, science, yeah. Science. Automotive, the automotive industry, you know, we have engines that are water-cooled. Motorcycles, the same way. Everything's water-cooled. We have aluminum, we have steel, we have copper, we have brass, we have lead. None of that stuff corrodes in a car, and that's in a more extreme situation than a PC. That's a good point. All because of the antifreeze coolant that's run in those machines forever and ever and ever. So while galvanic corrosion is an issue, it is an issue because people do not pay attention to what they're doing. So the types of coolant that you're running, if it doesn't have any glycol in it, you need to make sure that the metals are very close together on the periodic table, aka all copper. So the vodka's out. Yeah, vodka would not actually be a good 24-7 coolant. <sighs> However, it does make a pretty cool video and some nice drinks. All right, so let's bring this back a little bit. So if I am upgrading my M.2, obviously it's not water-cooled. No. And if I'm moving from two 1070s to one 2070 Super, maybe a 2080, I might be actually reducing my heat. Yes. I, in, well, in fact, I, I have to be, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's not going to be water-cooled, then we're losing probably 300 watts. Yeah. Well, even if I just did a single card, um, mm -hmm. it should be less. So... I think, obviously, I don't need a three by three, awesome, super giant water cooling radiator solution. No, not if you don't want to take it to land parties. Oh yeah, and it's probably heavy too. But it, what I think, what I'm hearing is that probably the existing setup is probably plenty. It is probably plenty. However, that TT Premium radiator that's run in your system, yeah. While I am sure that it will actually continue to run forever we might want to look at a, a better performing radiator like one of the Black Ices or even an EK radiator. Well, if we're going to redo the hard line, then it's definitely an opportunity for us to go back to the drawing board. For more information on the topics discussed in this podcast, please consult our show notes at hardwareasylum.com. Stay up to date on the latest at Hardware Asylum by subscribing to our RSS. Follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook. This has been an Engineering Production, copyright 2020. Thanks for listening.